Welcome back to The State of Work, the podcast by Lano, where we hear from business leaders and innovators, as well as freelancers and remote employees, exploring topics to do with the benefits, limitations, and solutions around remote and flexible work all around the globe. I'm your host, Maddie Duke. Today's guest is Richard Arundel, Chief Evangelist and Co-Founder at Currency Cloud, a globally distributed, remote-first SaaS scale-up that provides a fully cloud-based platform for B2B cross-border payments. As Chief Evangelist, Richard sits at the intersection of sales, product, marketing and growth while representing Currency Cloud as the market leader in embedded cross-border solutions. As a remote-first company, Currency Cloud has almost 400 employees worldwide. Richard talked us through the company's decision to go remote-first and how they approached managing and mastering the shift. Hi, Richard. Welcome to The State of Work. It's so great to have you. Thanks, Maddie. Good to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about Currency Cloud's shift to uh, a a successful remote work model. Um, Before we jump into that, Tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do at Currency Cloud. Yeah, so um, I've been at Currency Cloud since day one. Um, and kind of day one uh, was kind of end of 2008, early 2009. So a very interesting time to set up a financial services business. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've worn many hats, as you do in kind of startups, um, including spending three years um, in, in the US. Um, we got back from there and... December last year, so right in time for kind of lockdown in the UK. Um, mm-hmm. The kids were excited, and then Boris kind of cancelled Christmas uh, when mm-hmm. we came back. Um, but that's okay. Um, as I said, many hats, and my, my current title is um, Chief Evangelist um, at Currency Cloud, um, a, a, f- a, a title that was, I think, coined in Silicon Valley. And there have been some, right. some interesting kind of Chief Evangelist, kind of Guy Kawasaki is one of the better known uh, for his time at Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, my role at Currency Cloud is, is it's slightly different. And whilst there is an external element to what I do, I actually spend a lot of my time kind of internally um, at the, I guess, the cross section of our kind of go to market functions, so product marketing sales. Um, I have a sales background, but I have, a, I guess, a, a perspective, a unique perspective in the business of, kind of everything that's going on on that kind of go to market front and kind of talking to the business um, around what we're doing, where we're doing it, um, and putting a kind of an external lens on that as well. Now, Currency Cloud is spread across a few different countries. Maybe if we could grab a quick quick intro into what you're doing and where where the company's based and how it's all kind of operating around the world, um, just to get a good sense of that before we go a bit deeper. Yeah, of course. So we position ourselves as the experts in simplifying business in a multi-currency world. That's our marketing strapline. Um, what does that mean? Um, effectively, we're, we're, we're cross-border payments infrastructure. So we are, a, I guess, an enabler. So we don't go direct to market. Um, we service kind of other fintechs, FX companies, uh, banks, all who want to um, offer a cross-border payments or an FX service to their customers. As we know, cross-border payments or foreign exchanges inherently difficult. Um, And we kind of abstract those complexities and um, kind of uh, sell them as a suite of APIs for our customers to um, get a a better cross-border service for their customers. So the likes of kind of Revolut, likes of Monzo, Starling Bank, people have heard those people um, in the UK. Um, And also companies like Lano. (laughs) Yeah, and also companies like Lano, of course. Um, And that's actually, I think that's an interesting the, the the how the industry has changed because the revolutes and starlings of the world always set out to provide a financial service. I right, think someone yeah. like Lano probably didn't set up, maybe they did, but people in this space ultimately offering kind of HR pay- payroll type businesses, you wouldn't traditionally view that as a as offering kind of a cross-border payment service or going to market like that. But this whole rise of embedded finance um, over the last kind of couple of years has been really exciting. We can come on to that later. Um, but we have lots of customers like that um, in this space. And and as such, that, that kind of talks to us, you know, our growth and, and where we are. We, we were set up in the UK, and I guess our headquarters are here in the UK. Um, but like most people at the moment, we are we have about 420 offices around the world because we have about 420 employees. Um, but we, we have physical office, office space in, in London, in Cardiff, in New York, in Amsterdam, and now in, in Singapore. Yeah. Um, so of course, go to three or four jurisdictions. And are you finding that people are using those offices still? And and is the plan to to continue to run those offices, or are you move, moving towards a fully remote model? 
No, so we, we took the decision and, and it was Thursday the 12th of March in 2020. We did a, uh, a trial uh, work from home day because everything was kind of going on and nobody knew what, what was, was happening like in the world. Wired, like company wide. Company wide. Yeah. So across all our offices and we said, let's see if we can do this. Friday 13th of March, we hit the button and said, we're doing this. So the Thursday was a risky trial and Friday, it was, yeah, it was a risky, <laughs> risky day. Um, and it sticks in your memory, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. But so we said, we want to be a remote first business, not a remote business, a remote first okay. business. We will keep our brick, uh, you know, our brick and mortar offices. And they have been used, I think, probably by at least one person uh, pretty much throughout. But what we've found is that office space is um, is really important to a lot of people as a kind of collaboration environment, right? So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we were speaking, I was just speaking to someone on a recent episode as well about um, that it can sometimes do, uh, differ depending on obviously your, your personal circumstances at home um, and what kind of equipment and space you've got access to, as well as your personality and, and how you like how you work, whether you do excel kind of working alone or whether you are really a collaborative person. Um, and this kind of brings me to uh, in in at the end of 2020, Currency Cloud announced um, an investment of £1.5 million into this remote first working model. And I know there were some things like a, a stipend for, for staff to spend on upgrading what they've got at home. And could you share a bit more about that and how that money, like what what the intention of that is and how that's been executed over the last almost 12 months, I guess? Yes, I think you could probably break it down into into kind of three categories. The first was that, that, that stipend for people... Um, where they could expense a certain amount of money to basically upgrade their systems. I mean, I was one of these people at the time I was in New York and I was working from, I think, my wife's dresser in the corner <laughs> of the bedroom with like an old kitchen chair. Um, and I think we quickly realised that we were going to be in this this um, this new way of working you know, full time. So we, we said, listen, people need to upgrade. Mm. Um, so that's the first kind of use of, of that check. And we, we distributed certain office equipment where we could delivery of chairs and, and, and um, some of the screens in the office that we knew we weren't going to going to use. But I think it was, it was important to understand we had to, we had to address that. Then we kind of looked at the cost of, um, I guess, benefits. We said, mm. so how, how do we think about changing benefits? And that's an ongoing process. I think is how, how do we kind of change our benefits packages? Um, they're going to really kind of drive um, efficiency on, on a remote working basis. Um, and then I think, and, and, you know, and, and along with those benefits, we put on kind of various classes for people, got external speakers. And you know, I think the, the concept of kind of mental health and well-being and, and, and benefits around that is now more commonplace. But I think yes. we kind of jumped into that um, into that relatively relatively early. And as an aside, this doesn't cost us anything, but we also um, introduced the concept of mental health days, uh, which I think is quite important. We, we set really them at once a month. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's becoming more commonplace. And I think, um, and there's a bit of work to do, you know, mental health day is not like an extension to your holiday. You don't get an extra Monday after a bank holiday. Um, and it's yeah. important to talk about this as well. In every, you know, how do you use your mental health? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, again, that didn't cost us anything. Um, and actually I think we, you, you, see, you reap the benefits in your employees' mental health. For be. sure, yeah. There's plenty of research there. I think with the way that you treat your employees and and how obviously how well they are, not just physically but mentally, they're going to be working better on the days that they are. And I was going to say in the office, yeah. <laughs> but I meant like figuring out where they are in the office. Yeah, yeah. And then and then the third thing we did is we allocated a portion of the money to updating our actual physical office space um, oh, okay. for a much more collaborative environment. Okay. So there were certain certain things we decided to do in terms of kind of social distancing guidelines and you know, where I think our London office could accommodate 140, 150 odd people. Don't quote me on that. Um, we kind of reduced that to around kind of 80 seats um, for people to go in. But we changed it. We introduced, we, we brought in pods. We brought in kind of wider collaboration areas um, and just updated that, updated the Cardiff office. New York is, is, um, is on the list as well to do. Just so when you come into the office, and we have this concept of, you know, don't don't commute to compute. Don't just come in and sit at a desk, plug I yourself in. Yeah, yeah it's, it's quite a good phrase. And um, and I think it really works. And you know, different people, are, you'll go, like you said, you go into the office for different reasons. You might just not, you know, if your mum comes in, knocks on your door and offers you another cup of tea whilst you're on a call, you just can't handle it. So you have to get out of there. There we are. <laughs> Is this going to happen now? Yeah. And as much as I love my kids, yeah, as much as I love my kids, you know, kind of 3.30 when they come in from work, you know, it's like, oh, every day? No, you know I'm yeah. on a call. 
um, so, and you know, or, or you're sharing, um, you know, you're, you're sharing an apartment with with some friends, and you're competing for couch space and bandwidth. So some people just want to be in the office, but others actually use it as a chance to see people again, see actual people in three D. Yes. Um, and you know, I, I I change my days going into the office, so I see different people. So mm -hmm. I'm not just part of like the Wednesday club or the Thursday crew. And I I, I just think in certainly in our business and, and other. You know, business. I know you. There's still a lot of learning through osmosis, and it's and it's hard to do that kind of asynchronously. So I think when you're just in the office, when you're just hearing stuff, um, I just think you're learning a lot more. Um, that's certainly our, our opinion, anyway. So, yeah, I think I for sure. I think there's definitely something that I personally would agree with that as well. Um, being around other people can be really inspiring, and just some of those office side conversations that you have as you quickly pass someone can trigger an idea that changes your day or whatever. Um, yeah, so uh, along with kind of redesigning these office facilities and thinking of the office as a collaborative space and the home as maybe more of an, an individual working space or however people do need to use these different spaces, are you also looking at um, flexible, like kind of more flexibility in terms of time and the way people work? Yeah, I, th I think um, the new way of working has certainly put up a lens on it. I think previously we we were relatively flexible, and as as you have to be across kind of multiple time zones, and um, so I think that flexibility was always there. But certainly, kind of this kind of pandemic fueled flexibility is something that we, we we're conscious of, and 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 it's um, it's in in our ways of working anyway. So the way we set up a, a lot of our our businesses, especially in the go to market functions, is our kind of small, we call them pods. They are kind of small cross functional um, teams of, of of kind of specialists around industry segments and you know there's a huge amount of flexibility there is but it's all based on kind of trust in in who you're working with and kind of some peer-to-peer -peer accountability so you know if, if someone's got if you've set out you've got a common sh you know shared set of goals that you're working towards and you trust that you know if we're working in a team together i'd say listen maddie's going to do her job by this deadline if she's got to take an hour or two in the middle of the day to do whatever she needs to do she wants to go for a run if she needs to pick up kids if she needs to do whatever that's fine and and we encourage a, an environment and we foster an environment of talking about that um and i think you know certainly the, the pandemic but also the the way we've we've structured ourselves in these cross-functional teams really helps that and we and we call it and we talk a lot about um it's organizational health yeah is really what it is it sounds like sort of taking taking into account that we're each individuals with with lives beyond work and and how that can kind of merge and fit we're all individuals but zooms or, or hangouts they're pretty in, in, intrusive into your life they have backgrounds but yes. you know I, I actually don't bother having a background now. Yeah. you can see all my like Not kids right. up there on my on yeah. my um on <laughs> my pictures <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah, that's the thing i think in, in the initial stages everybody was like oh should i put up like a white screen and mm. do i need to go and you know tidy up behind me and you know if i've got a bit of a, a messy living room a messy, messy bedroom then i'll do my best to, to understand but i think now people are more comfortable and saying this is life yeah and there's there's a lot written about this as well, and, and there's kind of evidence that you know giving people this this autonomy, um, you know, driven by a sense of purpose or you know a, a set of goals, actually is really really good for productivity. Yes. And, and and we've seen that. You know, we've seen actually it's amazing how you say, listen, you you hire smart people who care, you let them get on with it, and kind of management is really there to to support them. You know, that that's kind of what it is. Um, and yeah, we, we've seen real benefits in that, and uh, I think it it just it just makes for a much more enjoyable environment when you're you're not saying, "Oh God, I've got to be at my desk at between nine and five or eight and six, whatever mm. it might be," um, and I've got to have it I've, I'm always on. This concept of always on, but yeah, it's fascinating. With this shift to remote first, have you also seen globally more collaboration? Like, you know, because people are on Zoom calls or whatever it is, however you connect anyway, are you able to kind of do a lot more international collaboration between the teams? Uh, yeah, we have. I, th I think um, I think actually the, the move for a company-wide remote first um, has been better for our for all the regions and and I speak personally about being in the US where you know, sometimes it was hard even down to meeting behaviors because if I was the only person on on the screen in the room then mm. it's easy to forget um and you know, I've had general examples of I've had to hold kind of a piece of paper up to the screen just saying you know can you can you be quiet please because they're just <laughs> they're just ignoring right. um and I think I think so a remote first environment and that's not just um 
international that's anybody because we still have people who were employed as remote workers you know in the new york office we have people on the west coast and in the uk we have you know some people who are remote right so I think, okay yeah i think that's been good I, th I think the one thing we've had to work on and a lot of people have had to work on is because you get used to being kind of remote and you know wherever you're sitting you are kind of you're always accessible um then you know we've got as i said we've got um, customers and, and employees out um out east in in our Singapore office, um, and that can be intrusive. You know, do you have to answer a, a, a question from them the minute you wake up? And if you do, you, you can be working from six a.m. and then you know to your West Coast US team at ten eleven p.m. and that that's not healthy. So you've got to find that balance. But I think what it's also um, encouraged people to do is is you know consume information a lot more kind of asynchronously. So people will become experts of that and writing stuff down. I'm still not perfect at this. And <laughs> any of my team looking at this is probably going to say, no, you're not. You're not. Um, but but the, the, the benefits of that have been, have been really, really important. And as you get better at that, then obviously that's going to, um, that's going to benefit all the people who are in kind of different regions. Build and grow your global team with Lano. Companies that want to hire talent in a country where they don't have a business presence or legal entity can use Lano's all-in-one platform to compliantly hire remote, full-time employees or freelance talent in over 150 countries. Find out more at lano.io. What are some of the other challenges of maintaining or managing a shift of culture when you're also shifting this kind of model of work or setup? I think it's new. It's new for, for a lot of people. There, there are plenty of kind of companies who've always been remote, but I think for companies who kind of built a, a culture, uh, by culture is kind of instilled beliefs and, and uh, beliefs and, and behaviors. Um, but when you used to do that kind of face to face and, um, you suddenly went to a either fully remote or kind of hybrid kind of model, I think we're still new. We're still kind of 18 months in. We're all finding our feet. And I don't think anybody's an expert at it yet. So there's always going to be challenges. At the moment, I guess our challenge is, because you know, half, half the company might want to go back um, two times a week, three times a week. Half the company, you know, a third of the company never want to go back to the office. A third of the company kind of like this maybe once every two weeks approach. So it, it's striking that balance. And then I think one of the biggest challenges that I've seen both at, at Currency Cloud and, and across the industry is is how you train and coach your managers because this is new to them and you know th there's less kind of one-to-one -one time and, and some people have been you know, coached and trained at having kind of physical one-to-one -one meetings and, and reading the signals from from your team and, and especially when you're understanding things like you know stress and mental health but I think doing that in 2D is a, is a different skill set altogether and it's when you kind of you know w when you bring people together what the cadence of that should you have like weekly meetings monthly meetings can you enforce that you know what about your your colleague that decided to up sticks from london and moved up to moved up to scotland what are you going to do are you going to you're going to pay for them to come back and there's there's no rules no guidelines at the moment around that what or best practices but yeah that what, what we've tried to work hard on i guess is is the management layer um yeah, anybody managing people who and and you know me personally i used to when you know, my direct reports, I used to love seeing them and, and interacting with them, uh, be it a team meeting or, or a one-on-one, -on -one, and learning those skills to do it in a kind of remote environment. Um, how often do you do it? You know, what are these yeah. check-ins? And, and meeting behaviours. We worked a lot about meetings and, and making meetings effective because I think the default in a remote environment is to stick an hour in with someone. Yes. Um, then suddenly, you're, 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 I don't know what your calendar's like, but suddenly it's like, well, when, when, do, I, when do I go to the toilet, let alone yeah. have lunch? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's understanding of what good meetings look like. And so, yeah, so I think that's probably the biggest challenge that we face. Um, and I think it probably is quite common. Um, and then going back to your point around, you know, forcing people or convincing them that they don't always have to be on. They need to take their breaks. You know, it's okay to take an hour because you do that probably in London, you know, go for a walk. Um, and I'm really bad at this because you get stuck. And you know, oh, I've got a free hour. I just you know, speak to this person or do this piece of work. I think to step away because you know, a, a it's a mental thing, but physically you just become you know, really sedentary and um, yeah, yeah, you get up and move. Especially you know, given the broader context of this, also having all happened for a lot of companies um, during a global pandemic, and so yeah. <laughs> for a lot of a lot of the time, there's kind of this almost dull trauma or worse, you know, of like 
well, there's been parts of this time that we've actually had to stay home and, you know, you, you want people to still feel happy to be at home and not stuck there and, and yeah, encouraging movement, encouraging interactions that are yeah. not work-related yeah. or, you know. You, you did mention you've got a couple of employees in Currency Cloud that are actually remote or, and maybe were even prior to this shift to remote first. Um, is that something now that you're seeing as an option, like if everyone's kind of in their own home office as a default, does that also then open up the possibility of hiring someone that lives beyond those uh, locations where you've got physical offices? Yes, is a simple answer. We're working through, <laughs> uh, there, there are, when you, when you get into it, there, there are certain kind of you know, tax implications, um, depending on where we are, for, for not just currency, but for, for, the, for the employees, right? Yes, um, yeah. But there are plenty of um, businesses out there who, who can help companies like us. Um, like, like everybody, we're looking at this as suddenly the, the, the world of talent has opened up. And you know, it's not just current employees, but it is, you know, it's great for current, current employees to have that flexibility. And maybe they were thinking about moving to the Cotswolds, but you know, it's, it's a pain to get into the office, but now they can do. But also, um, you know, the, assuming you, know, you, you get all the contracts in place um, and you work out the finer details, you can, you can hire people in most places around the world. And that, 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 that pool of talent is just incredible. Uh, and that, that kind of cognitive diversity that gives you as a team and as a business is just brilliant in terms of, especially as, as designers, you know, as we become more global as a business and the, as the world becomes more global, I think you know, having people um, spread across um, kind of different countries and, and different backgrounds is fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> and and we, I think we have someone, I think we have someone in the Reunion Islands which is one of those oh. places where you need a map. Yeah. And even and not just um, you know permanent locating, but I think if you know we're pretty flexible. If someone says, "Listen, I'm you know I'm going to go, I'm going on holiday for two weeks, but can I extend for a, a week or two and, and work out there?" Um, I think the benefits, and, and I've personally saw those benefits. You know, I I spent um, whilst I was in New York, living in New York in 2020, I spent more time out of New York than I did inside because kids were remote learning. Yeah. My my Manhattan apartment was, was very small for three kids and, and myself and my wife. And so we kind of just traveled a little bit. Um, and, you know, we, we have a few people in the US doing the same thing. You know, they're young, they're, they're, they're out of their, their apartment lease, so why not take off, you know? And I think that goes back to that trust, that autonomy that they're going to do the right thing. And, um, and so far sure. it's worked out really well. And I think, you know, a lot of people are kind of, there's a lot of chatter about the great resignation and, you know, how employers are going to have to adapt or have already had to adapt really. Also to allow this flexibility that people now kind of feel entitled to and and I guess are entitled to, you know, like, um, why not? So Yeah. And what we've found, I think what the interesting thing, speaking to um, a number of different people across the industry, is when it first happened... I think there was an expectation that you know, as people move out of, say, let's use the UK as an example, as people move out of the UK, uh, out of London, you, know, you might not have to pay them a London salary anymore. But that's not yes. true. Yeah, it's that's not true. <laughs> it's, it's kind of balance. It, we thought it might kind of balance to you know where, where they might be, but no, that's not true because people are commanding, I guess, a a you know a, a remote salary, um, which is great for for the employees. It's fantastic mm. for the employees, and I think it's fair, right? So you, you can work where you want to work. Um, but I th and you're right; people need to adapt, need to understand this. I think those that are, um, you know, those persons who, I, I think who aren't um, progressing like this are going to miss out on the best talent. Um, yes, and potentially, you know, increased turnover costs and yep. whatever else. You know, it might it might be an investment um, to create a setup that really works and allows people to do their jobs well and happily in this kind of setup. Um, but the payoff is... Right, the payoff is great. And if you are crunching the numbers, then the way we looked at it is, you know, the, the, the OPEX of our um, of our London office, we were going to have to take some more space anyway. Now we don't need to. Right. So yeah. what do you do with that kind of saved cash? You invest it in, you, know, you don't say, oh, I'm going to bank this. Well, that's certainly what, what we did. We said we're going to invest it in, in creating an environment to you know, retain, grow, um, and attract the best talent possible. Um, and I think that's, you know, and we kind of split it into those three kind of categories. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. you know, that, that kind of that 
we haven't really touched on this, but one of the other think challenges people have is um, is how you develop people in this in this yes. environment. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, going back to that kind of management training and coaching, it's making sure that it, this isn't just a check in. Yeah. You know, how might people are you know, driven by or a lot of people are driven by by personal or professional improvement, yes. and yes. You know, that I think that's something that people have had to work on about how you do that in a remote environment. I think it's, it's, a, it's a different skill um, and one that people need to know. As I said, what we've spent a lot of time on is creating this kind of clarity um, and reinforcing that clarity across our organisation at, at a business level, but also as a personal level. Um, and I think the conversations are just slightly different. Um, and you know, we spent a lot of time you know, building up what we call um, kind of vulnerability-based trust with both our teams, but uh, but also uh, you know our peers and our and our um, and, and the people that work for us, um, and to have those conversations, I think conversations are probably just slightly more vulnerable and, and more open now in a remote environment. And the trick is to to, to coach people about how to kind of mine for that and how to get that out and bring that out of people, because you know it's it's easy enough to kind of switch off your video in a remote setting, um, where it's not in the physical world. So it's how you how you kind of tap into that kind of psychology and really understand you know, how you can develop these people, how you can help them. Yeah, and what, and what they want and what's going on. For them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Outside of work, it's really important, I think, to, to spend a bit more time getting to know them on a, on a kind of personal level and understand, you know, what is it about your day? You know, so I, I didn't want to say I can hear your kids screaming in the background. How does, <laughs> how does that affect you? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we, we had great examples and of both internal but also external there's there's one thing that stays with me there was a um one of one of our team in the u.s she used to have kind of regular catch-ups with one of her customers um and both had young kids and both were kind of screaming in the background so they would play a game of guess the screaming child <laughs> and like the, the rapport that it built was, was amazing um and and you know they they they're really good friends now so that's awesome. Yeah, that's nice. I think also like allowing sometimes the kid to come onto the call. You yeah. Know, if that's what needs to happen, that's what can happen. You know, and I think it's really nice when, when workplaces allow for that sort of flexibility. Maybe final question from me. Um, we're about a year and a half beyond this Friday the 13th date when you went remote and committed to that setup. What are the biggest learnings you've had? Um, challenges, highlights, lowlights? What are some of the biggest things that stick out to you? Well, I'll start with the highlight is we we didn't procrastinate in terms of our decision to go to remote first. Yeah. We mm -hmm. we took a decision and we went for it. As I said, you know, Thursday trial, Friday, we're doing this. And let's invest in this, you know. Um so it's kind of acting fast, I think was um that, that kind of set us up and set the I think the tone for us as business to be kind of successful and and um and support the employees. Um, yeah, I don't know whether this is a, a pandemic learning or just a general learning, but it's reinforced that it is all about the people and and looking after your people and 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 and, and coaching in the right areas. You know, I come back to this kind of coaching of of, of people managers and how important that is because um, you know, I think as as we scaled as well, it's not just you know a message from the top. You don't just you know suddenly come down. The, from the mountain with a list of commandments it's how you kind of you, you coach your teams and reinforce that across your teams uh, and keep reinforcing it across your teams you know practice what you preach you know, it's easy for you know kind of executive senior leadership to say oh you must take your mental health day or you must take your, va you know, your vacation you can't you know you shouldn't be responding to emails on, on a weekend or in the evening and then you do it anyway um so i think i think that i think the other learning is um a personal learning is I am not a fully remote. I'm not set up for fully remote. I have to have physical interaction. You know, I go into the office once a week, maybe once every 10 days. Um, low lights. Listen, I, I think everybody struggled. Uh, everybody, you know, if you go back and uh, yeah, pandemic aside, because I think we all had kind of personal low lights. Of course. Um, from a company point of view, there's not too many, really. I, th I think we've handled it pretty well, and I think we've you know, we've made some decisions pretty quickly. So we haven't kind of regretted anything we've done, I don't think. But I think time will tell. As I said earlier, it's we're only eighteen months into this kind of new world. Nobody knows everything. If they say they do, they're lying. <laughs> um, but no, and then yeah, as I said, a lot of learnings, but all for me centers around people, centers around customers, 
Um, and I think we've, I think we've, we've tackled some of these pretty well. Um, but it's, you know, you look after your people, they look after your customers, don't try and do everything. It's, it's all around kind of coaching of, of your people managers, which is really important. Give them the tools to succeed. Um, and, and as I said, the other one is the, the interesting learning was, I guess, the, um, kind of the salary leveling and you know, the expectations of, oh, okay, I can open this up and maybe I'll get, you know, two people or three people for the price of two if I'm not hiring in, in the middle of, middle of town, but no, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, a lot of people think differently about that. It, it, it yeah. is interesting, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that sounds really great. It sounds to me like you've got a, a fantastic kind of attitude of, of openness and, and willingness to both learn and also equip everyone else with the skills that you need to figure out, that everyone needs to, to kind of have to continue to manage this this change. And I think that this, you know, trialing it on Thursday and deciding on Friday and just committing to it, even at a time when the world wasn't really quite sure at that stage still how how big and how long the pandemic would be affecting us for. So what a great um, kind of commitment and and a commitment to clarity as well, like giving, giving your employees. You know, I, I have friends back home who've been in and out of lockdown and in and out of the office constantly as Melbourne has gone in and out of lockdowns over the last year and a half. And that, that in itself is just absolutely so draining and so exhausting and, and they don't have a lot of right? power of choice there. It's just like, Oh, now we're back in. Oh, now we're one day one off, you know, like it's, yeah. it's, that's just so draining. And I think that having made that commitment that, that you've made very early on um, and you've given yourself so much time and you've, made that investment into to what was needed initially to kind of kick that off as well sounds fantastic and this and we're, and we're proud of the job we've done and, and i think you know and if you look at i guess our our business model as well you know we a lot of our customers are our fintechs and and people who are kind of a, 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 adapting this and i guess you know, fintech certainly in, in the uk but i think you know they are leading the charge with this kind of new way of working and so it hasn't all been our ideas we talked to we talked to you know partners we talked to a lot of our customers about this type of stuff um and you know it's it's whilst what we do is very exciting you know to talk about kind of cross-border payments infrastructure when you take that away and say let's actually talk about people how are you doing it you know how are you servicing your your customers and, and how you talk about your people and you're learning a lot um as i said it's um it's fascinating i think i think some other kind of incumbent industries or incumbent institutions can learn a lot as well from these ways of working and I think the risk is if they don't, they might start to lose some of their top talent um, because people are realizing this is the new way of working. I think what's been fascinating is is how quickly there have been you know, companies that have either pivoted or even been set up to support this way of working. And it's a booming industry, um, which which is great. So this isn't you know a fad. This is a you know it's a it's an evolution. It's not quite a revolution. But it's an evolution of of the ways mm -hmm. of working. Um, and you know. If, anybody listening wants to, to pick my brains uh, about more of the stuff that we've done or, or I've seen, then always happy to talk about this. I'm quite passionate about it and, you know, personal changes for me in my life. So it's been great. Great. Well, we'll make sure to keep, to pop your details on the, on the podcast website as well. Um, and I think that's it from me. So thanks so much. Really enjoyable conversation and I'm really happy for you that it's gone so well. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Maddie. It's been great. wherever you listen to podcasts you can also find us on instagram or twitter by searching for the state of work for more information about today's topic and links to further reading check out our show notes at podcast.lano.io thanks for listening and see you next time on the state of work